video, we're going to talk a little bit about the sense of smell, or what's also known as the sense of olfaction. So we all know that you smell with your nose, but I want to talk a little bit about the sensory organ that's actually located in the nose that allows you to be able to do this. If you look at the diagram that I have here, you've got a head that's been cut sagittally, so that you can see inside of the nasal cavity. And you'll notice up here at the top of the nasal cavity, we've got a little structure that's labeled as the olfactory epithelium. This structure is about the size of a postage stamp. And if you were to look at it, it has a yellowish tinge to it. And this is the organ that actually picks up odor molecules and allows you to be able to smell. So if we were to take this area of the nose and magnify it more highly, what we would see is something that looks like this over here. So I want to explain to you a little bit this diagram to help you understand the structures that are involved in the sense of smell. So up in here we have a structure that you've learned about previously. This is actually, actually cranial nerve number one, which is the olfactory nerve. And hopefully you remember from back when we were talking about the cranial nerves that this is the nerve that carries sensations on smell to the brain. So it basically allows you to be able to smell. Just below that cranial nerve number one, you can see the cribriform plate. So the cribriform plate is actually a structure of the skull. It's bone and it separates what's inside the cranium, including the olfactory nerve that you can see here, from what's inside the nasal cavity. And one of the things that you'll notice that's kind of interesting about this cribriform plate is that it's porous. You can see we've got these little holes that actually extend through the cribriform plate and those holes allow neurons or nerve cells from the olfactory nerve to pass from the olfactory nerve and extend down actually into the nasal cavity and specifically into this olfactory epithelium. So if you look at these neurons, they're bipolar, they're represented in yellow on this diagram. And these are neurons that are also referred to as olfactory receptor cells. And the reason that they're called the olfactory receptor cells is because these are the neurons that are actually binding to odorant molecules and sending signals back to the brain through the olfactory nerve on the sense of smell. Notice here that the dendritic end of these olfactory receptor cells kind of splays out into these little hair-like structures which are known as cilia. So they're also sometimes referred to as olfactory cilia. And again, this is the dendritic end of one of these bipolar neurons that allows you to sense smell. So remember the dendritic end is kind of our sensory receptor end. This is the area where odorant molecules are actually going to bind. So here on these olfactory cilia to allow these bipolar neurons to initiate action potentials and send signals back to the brain on the sense of smell. One of the things that I want you to notice about the olfactory cilia is they are bathed in a layer of mucus. So the nose is lined with a mucous membrane. It's producing mucus all the time. And one of the reasons that this is really important is it allows you to be able to smell. We've talked about chemoreceptors before and the fact that they respond to chemicals in solution. Olfactory receptor cells are chemoreceptors. So they are not able to allow you to smell if there's just odorant molecules in the nose. Those odorant molecules actually have to dissolve into this layer of mucus that lines the epithelium of the nose before they can actually bind to the receptors on the dendrite. So this layer of mucus is really important. It's worth pointing out because it allows these chemoreceptors that detect smells to be able to work. It gives the odorant molecules a liquid to dissolve in that's going to allow them to cause the chemoreceptors to fire. In addition to the bipolar neurons that you're seeing here, those olfactory receptor cells, you'll notice we've got some neurons that in this picture, in this artist's representation, are pink. These are what are known as supporting cells. So you'll notice that they're kind of interspersed between these bipolar neurons and they play, as their name implies, a supporting role. So they're there to cushion, they're there to protect these bipolar neurons so that they can function well. The other type of cell that we have associated with the olfactory epithelium or with this sensory organ of smell 
are what are known as basal cells. You can see a couple of these. Here's one right here that are represented in yellow. These are actually stem cells, and they replace our olfactory receptor cells, these yellow bipolar neurons, when those yellow bipolar neurons become worn out or damaged. So we are actually capable of replacing the neurons in the nose that are responsible for smell. This is one of only two places in the body where we have the capability of replacing neurons. In other areas of the body, for example, if you have damage to neurons in the eye or in the ear or in the spinal cord or the brain, those tend to cause injuries that are permanent because the body is not able to regenerate neurons. However, here in the nose, and also in the tongue, we have neurons that are capable of regeneration. And the reason for this is likely due to the fact that they're in a very exposed place. So if you think about when you breathe air in, a lot of times it's hot and dry, or it's really, really cold, or sometimes it's full of things like dust or pollen grains or other pollutants that can be damaging to the neurons that are just kind of hanging down there in the roof of the nose and cause them to become worn out over time or damaged over time. So we need to have a way to be able to replace those neurons and that happens through the basal cells, those stem cells that we have kind of interspersed with the olfactory epithelium. With this last slide, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what we know about actually activating these bipolar neurons or the olfactory receptor cells. So believe it or not, smell seems like a pretty simple thing, right? It is the special sense that we know the least about, that we have the least understanding of how it actually works. It would seem like vision is so much more complicated that that would be the one that we had the least understanding of. That's not the case, it's actually smell. So I'm gonna give you a very abbreviated, kind of simplified um, talk through of what we know about smell up to this point and how it actually works. If you look at this picture here, just to give you kind of a representation of what you're seeing, since this is still kind of new, you've got the olfactory nerve, so that's the cranial nerve number one. Here's the cribriform plate. So there's those little holes through the cribriform plate that allow the olfactory receptor cells to extend down from the olfactory nerve and actually extend into the roof of the nasal cavity. So this is now the roof of the nasal cavity. You can see those bipolar cells, little cilia down here that bind to odorant molecules. In between that, we have those supporting cells kind of interspersed in between these different neurons. And of course, it's not visible here, but there would be a mucus layer that's lining this, because this is a mucous membrane, that's bathing those cilia on the olfactory receptor cells in mucus, so that odorant molecules have something to dissolve into when they're binding to those receptor cells. So you smell effectively when odorant molecules, so little tiny particles of whatever it is you're smelling, get into the nose and they dissolve in the mucus that lines that olfactory epithelium and that allows them to bind to proteins on the cilia of these bipolar cells. When they bind to these bipolar cells, that causes a chemical stimulus, a chemical change in the environment of these bipolar neurons, and you get a nerve impulse moving away from the neuron up through the cribriform plate, synapsing with neurons here in the olfactory bulb, and moving from there back to the olfactory cortex of the brain where smells are actually interpreted. We're capable of smelling or differentiating about 10,000 different scents as human beings, and it's thought that the way our brain tells the difference between different smells is based on the pattern of proteins on the cilia that actually bind. So here's a really simplified representation of that. Let's say you're smelling cinnamon. Cinnamon perhaps is an odorant molecule, binds to proteins one, two, and three on the cilia. If you're smelling vanilla, there are other proteins, maybe four, five, and six that vanilla binds to. If you're smelling a rose, maybe it's protein 7, 10, and 12 that are located on the cilia that a rose would bind to. But when you have these different proteins being bound, the signal that's being sent back from these neurons is slightly different, and you get a pattern of signals that's different from smell to smell, traveling back towards the olfactory cortex in the brain. And those different patterns are going to be interpreted differently by the brain.